Hi, my name is Roy Rumbo. I am an accounting professor at the University of North Texas. I teach Intermediate Accounting 1 and 2. And today's uh, lecture is for my Intermediate Accounting 2 students in Accounting 3120. And we're going to talk about lease accounting. And as I said, uh, as we go through, every chapter gets a little bit harder. This is, especially this chapter is all new. Didn't have anything of, like this, in, at least in our principal's classes at UNT. So uh, we're going to give a lot of credit here to McGraw-Hill. I'm using their Spiceland, Nelson, and Thomas textbook materials. Great materials. Highly, highly recommend the book. And with that, I'm going to get started here. There we go. So we're gonna talk about leases. And, you know, this is all new. I never, this is crazy. I never had to do lease accounting uh, like I'm gonna teach you. They, the rules passed in uh, 2016 and it, you know, it took 10 years, a lot of exposure drafts from the FASB to decide on how we're going to calculate, how we're going to record leases on the balance sheet. And the big issue was that uh, a lot of companies, all companies had a lot of leases and they just record lease expense and never recorded the lease obligation. So, but when you have a 10, 20, 30 year lease, that's a really big obligation that's not, was not showing up on the balance sheet. And so the FASB had to find ways to get there that to uh, require companies to put these uh, leases on their balance sheet. So those rules were implemented in 2017 and 2018. At that point, I was already teaching. And so uh, just so you know, uh, the rules I'm teaching you are kind of the basic core rules. There's always a lot of devil in the details and nuances that uh, make it really hard for large global public companies like I, I was where I was working. So with that, let's get started. So I am going to um, you know, talk about leases at Lenox. And one reason, you know, I think I saw um, I, saw, I, I looked at Ray, my professor once, they said, man, I learned more about Lennox than I learned about a, accounting for Roy. So I, I do apologize to that particular student, but I like to use Lennox because I know Lennox and I know the backstory. I was the chief accounting officer for 11 years. So um, part of the strategy Lennox had was to, um, you know, uh, put these parts plus stores all over the country. Now they're selling, uh, Linux parts and equipment, but not to regular consumers. These are just for dealers. And it made it so much e easier for dealers to buy our parts. And so it was a great strategic initiative at Linux. I think when I left, they had about 250 or 300 of these stores um, just you know, uh, throughout, throughout the country. But the one thing about these stores, and the reason I bring them to your attention here, it's gonna be a different kind of lease than we had for our headquarters. These were three-year leases for the most part, I believe. And if we didn't like the location, we would just move. And so, you know, we were always transitioning these to various different locations. So there's no case where we were like an owner of that property. And so that's what we're going to get into in this chapter. Is the lease contract um, more in substance like you're the owner of that property. And if, the, if you are in substance more like an owner in the lease, we're gonna change the accounting for you. And so that's certainly not true in this case for our parts plus stores at Linux. And so these are what in the rules that you're going to learn were called operating leases. So there was no case where they were like uh, we were the owner. Now, however, I will note here, and you're gonna see this, even operating leases go on the balance sheet. So it's how the income statement um, is handled is different for operating leases, but even operating leases will go on the balance sheet. There we go. So here's our, here, our Linux headquarters over in Richardson. Beautiful, nice property. In here was a cafeteria. We even had a gym in there. So it was a, it was a great place to work and I highly recommend it if you get a chance to work there. It's a great industry. Now, but why do I show you this beautiful picture of our headquarters? This building here, uh, we never own. Uh, we, uh, a bank, a, a consortium of banks owned it and leased it to us. And what in the old rules, 
was called a synthetic lease. You know, you know, synthetic means kind of fake lease, right? So why was it called a synthetic lease? Well, the the way the the way the contract worked is it was a, usually seven year leases, and we rolled it over. This is all public available knowledge. I'm not sharing any inside knowledge here, uh, and we disclosed this lease in in the footnotes to our um, our financial filings. So uh, at the end of the seven years, if the value of that property is dropped below X amount, we have to make up the difference, <laughs> you know, if we want to get out of the lease. And so we were protecting um, the owner of that property, the banks, with the value of that property. They had no risk of loss. We had the risk of losses. If that market value of that property dropped by 50%, we would, and we wanted to get out of that property, we would be on the hook for that. What does that sound like? That sounds like an owner of the building. Yet we were never had legal title of this and we made lease payments throughout. And so, and that, this particular building, and it would have been a very large amount, uh, was never on our balance sheet. And so, uh, you know, prior to these new rules, with these new rules, this property did come on the Lennox balance sheet. And so just trying to show you, you know, and highlight the kind of differences between what might be an operating lease and a, um, a lease where you're more substantially the owner of the property. And the thing I would also, um, you know, add here is that, well, how do we, how do the accounting rules come in and make a judgment call how do you use the accounting rules to decide whether you're more like an owner or more like just an operating lease? That was hard. And so they had to come up with some criteria in the rules to differentiate, you know, whether you uh, have an operating lease or more of a, you know, what we call a finance lease. So let's take a look at this. So what is a lease? Uh, the lessor, so here's some, some new terms for you. They're not going to be as bad as uh, bonds payable. I promise you that. So lessor is the owner of the property, and, uh, and they, through a contractual arrangement, allow uh, the lessee to use the property. So it's a right to use the property or the asset. There could be, you know, you could lease equipment, forklifts, copiers, computers, everything. So the lessor is the owner who gives to the lessee uh, who will use the property the right to use that. For that right, the lessee is going to make periodic cash payments, many times um, like annuities, right? So we're getting back into present value here when we start thinking about annuities, right? It's a fun, fun. Why do people lease things? You know, I, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna be a little cynical here and get back to the bottom uh, part. Prior to the new accounting, a lot of people lease things so that they did not end up on their balance sheet. So a lot of airline companies lease their planes. And, you know, so, you know, if one airline company owned their planes and they have all these big assets on their books and debt, and another airline company leased their planes, did not have that asset or that lease obligation on their books, man, it was hard to compare those two airline companies. And so, again, why did one, and sometimes those airline companies probably didn't want all that, um, that, the debt and the asset on their books, on their balance sheet. They wanted a cleaner, simpler balance sheet and the leasing allowed that. But there are, you know, I'm not a tax expert, but there are tax advantages of leases. Um, maybe uh, I always like the fact that we leased computers both at Linux and at Maytag because it forced people, like usually had a, like the laptops I use at Linux had a three-year lease. So at the end of the three-year lease, you hand it over and you get a new laptop. And so it, I liked it because it kind of forced us to, um, to change um, and get newer equipment every three or four years. And you know, some people lease cars for that, um, for that, that way. And so again, uh, for accounting purposes, we're gonna have two, uh, two uh, classifications. Uh, and um, again, the lessee and the lessor, we're gonna do the accounting for both the person who is using the equipment through the lease and a person who is who owns equipment and giving it to the lessee for their use over the term of the lease. And when I talked about uh, whether it was a 
uh, you more substantially own the own the, the property versus leasing it, that's a finance lease. So the lessee will call this a finance lease. So in substance, if the lessee really owns the equipment in this finance lease, then the lessor has sold it. Really, even though there's a lease there, they really don't own it anymore. Think about that headquarters building. The banks who leased that equipment to us, they had no, no risk of loss, right? So it was really the we owned the building. And it, for the lessor side, they had sold it to us. And so we call that on the lessor side a sales type lease. Now, a sales type lease uh, can, can create profit or no profit just from selling. There's always, for the lessor in a sales type lease, there's always going to be interest income. And some companies, they're just leasing companies. They buy equipment and they lease it to you and they don't make any profit at all. Their whole incentive is interest, interest income from leasing the equipment to you. Other people might manufacture very large equipment. You know, think John Deere with big, thing, big, big, gigantic uh, trucks they're selling to farmers. They might farmers don't be able to pay for that, so they'll they'll do a lease that looks like more like a finance lease for the farmer. But uh, John Deere, they're going to have a profit on that, and so it's a sales lease with profit. They're going to have a profit. You know, man, the difference between the manufacturing costs and the value of that lease, that will be a profit. And so that's gonna change some of our accounting for that. They will still have, even with selling profit, also interest income, if it's a sales type lease. Now, if it's an operating lease for both sides, uh, the lessor keeps the asset on their books. Uh, they are, it's a pure lease like the old days, like rent. And the lessee will just record straight line kind of interest expense that are very close to the lease payments. In, in most circumstances. So again, I want you to think here, let's divide this in uh, like quadrants. I want you to understand what a lessee is. And now I don't want you to understand, I want you to understand what a lessor is, so right there. And then this quadrant here, uh, I want you to understand a finance versus an operating lease, sales type lease versus an operating lease. Fortunately, the criteria to decide whether it's an operating lease or a finance lease, operating lease or sales type lease, it's the same criteria, both for the lessor and the lessee. So that kind of makes it easy. And, and here you go. So uh, a lease is a finance lease for the lessee and a sales type lease for the lessor if it just meets one of these five criteria. Now, again, we go back to the very first thing I said, uh, what these criteria are trying to do is in substance, is this lease more like the lessee has bought the equipment. Therefore, <laughs> I can do operating lease accounting if they really own it. So each of the each one of these five, if you meet one of these five, you're probably more like as a lessee, you, you now have bought the property. And as a lessor, you sold the property. So a sales type lease. So let's look at these. If the ownership of the asset transfers to the lessee at you know, maybe at the end of the lease then clearly that's more like um, a purchase, right? If the agreement um, contains a bargain purchase option at the end. I know we lease some, uh, an old factory to a, um, um, to a city, and I think the lease payments are really tiny, and it was a $1 purchase price at the end. So for $1, <laughs> they went on the entire factory and all the land that was associated with it. And we're trying to do that to be good corporate, good community citizens. Uh, this is in South Carolina. And so if there's a bargain purchase option at the, at the end, well, is it the same as one? Basically, the ownership is going to transfer because they, it's such a bargain to purchase it that the, the lessee is going to purchase it. And so we'll treat the whole lease as if it was already sold. Now, a little bit more complicated here. If the lease term is for the major part of the remaining economic life of the asset. So major part, and this is where the rules kind of change. We used to have some criteria like this, and this used to say 75%, but everybody tried to skirt the rules by getting down to 74.99%. Ah, I passed, I'm not in it. And so this is back to what the FASB is trying to do is more principle-based counting. Now, 
all the major accounting firms, all the big four have said major part, major part equals about 75%. So if you're at 74.99, you, you meet this. And so why, why is this like owning? If, if in your lease, uh, let's say you lease a car, let's, let's use a more company corporate example, lease a big uh, truck, you know, and the lease term is 10 years. And the life cycle of that truck is about 11 years, let's say, just for, uh, I don't know what it would be. So, man, there's nothing left. That truck, you've used almost the entire life of that truck. So, yeah, you did. It's not a lease. You bought that truck. And so this is one uh, that gets to the major part. Now, um, I want you to think about it. Everybody gets confused on these. And I had, I had a multiple choice for my, my classes. And they always uh, miss this because it's major part versus substantially all. Major part, that's for the remaining economic life. And that's about 75%. Substantially all is more like 90% and it's related to the value. So if the, back to time value of money, if the present value of all the lease payments equals or exceeds substantially all of the fair value of the underlying asset, well, basically, guess what? You bought it. You know, don't, you know, don't say otherwise. Don't try to be tricky here. And now this is usually referred to as 90%, you know, you know but if you're 89.99, still substantially all. And if ASB was never said, and they've been asked, what percent did you imply here? They said, no, no, substantially all. You know, if they're trying to get to uh, principle-based accounting rules versus rules-based. Why? Because people get the rules and they try to skirt around them you know, within 0.1% of the 90%. So that has been captured here now uh, with, with good terms here that they're using. And finally, if the asset is so specialized that nobody else could use it except the lessee, so maybe specifically designed for a use by a lessee that nobody else could use. And there, you know, probably um, in some large refineries or whatever, there may be some really big equipment specifically designed that could only work in that particular configuration in that factory. So uh, you just have to think about, I think you'll know it when you see it, uh, when you're out there, you know, uh, practicing accounting. So here's an example, um, uh, Sans Sari Publishing leased uh, equipment. Uh, they purchased it for 479,000 and there's six annual payments of 100,000 um, beginning, by the way, the payments for leases are at the beginning of the uh, period. You know, so when we start doing present value, we're gonna have to use what? I hope you get this right. Not the present value of an ordinary annuity, the present value of an annuity due. And so if you use a calculator, you got to use the begin mode. If you're using a table, you got to make sure you're using the present value of the award annuity due table, because these are at the beginning of the lease. So this is a six year lease and their annual payments. So N is going to be equal to six and I, I will be determined. Well, here it is, uh, 10%. And there's some rules around the interest rates. We'll probably get there the slide, I'll wait and see if we see that slide. How should this lease be classified? Well, we take the $100,000 uh, in equals six, I equal to 10%, and yes, PBAD, annuity due, and that equals 479,000. Does the agreement specify the ownership transfer? No. Does agreement contain a purchase target that is reasonably certain to be a bargain purchase option? No. Um, uh, is the lease term the major part? Six-year lease term, six-year life? Yes. We could stop there because you only have to meet one of these criteria. Keep that in mind, only one. But guess what? Uh, the present value of the lease payment is, is uh, greater than substantially all, which is usually 90%, of the fair value, so yes. Does the asset have no option? No. Again, we met two of the criteria, so bang, we're, we're there. So uh, we're gonna record a, a right of use asset 
for 479,000. So this is a finance lease, sales type lease. And so the six payments, uh, okay. And so uh, we, yes, from the, from the less lessee side, the person using uh, this equipment, printing equipment, they're going to record debit to a right of use asset and their credit uh, a lease obligation. Okay, so we got to decide what I to use in the uh, time value of money problem here. We call that the, the discount rate because we're discounting it back to the present value. We're trying to understand the present value so that that interest rate is many times referred to as in both pension accounting and here in lease accounting, and it may be in finance as well, is the discount rate. So what rate do we use? Because it's going to change the answer. You know, a higher rate is going to end up in a lower uh, present value versus, you know, the payments. And uh, a, uh, a lower rate is going to end up in a higher present value, you know, because there's less interest you know, there. So we, you know, um, if we know the lessor's, um, if we know the implicit rate um, of the lessor, what interest rate the lessor was using, we are required to use that rate. Now, how many times do you think you know that rate? Because you're leasing from, and they, even if they know it, they may not want to tell you, but they know it for sure, but they're not going to tell you. And so guess what? Then we have to use what's called the incremental borrowing rate. You know, how do, how do I come up with the incremental borrowing rate? I'm not a finance person. I'm, you know, an accountant. Uh, they're easy for me. Let's say we're going to buy equipment that's about worth a million dollars. I go down to the treasurer's office who borrows money. And I said, hey, and uh, his name was Rick. I said, Rick, if I had to borrow a million dollars today, you know, just right now off the spot, how would you borrow that million dollars and what would the interest rate be? So the incremental, you wouldn't use some weighted average of all your debt. No, you say, what, do you, what would you go borrow? And a lot of times people say, well, I'd use the revolver. I say, what's the interest rate of the revolver? I write it down and I come back and do my lease calculations there. Now I would write up a little white paper, had conversation with the Rick. I'd probably make Rick sign it to agree to that so that I would, the auditor and for myself, that it was back to chapter one, verifiable. You know, so, uh, so a lot of times we use the incremental borrowing. Point here, if you know the lessor's implicit rate, you got to use that first, if you know it. Again, most time you want. So when you get a multiple choice question, you'll have to look at that. All right, journal entry time. Oh, baby, that, this is the fun stuff, right? So the lessee, uh, day one, when the lease starts, and we're talking right now only about finance leases. We'll get to operating leases at the end of the chapter. They're going to record debit right of use asset for the present value of those lease payments using the annuity due, and they'll record a, a, a lease payable, $479,000. What does the lessor do? Okay, uh, instead of a lease payable, they have a lease receivable. So it looks exactly like uh, the, uh, the lessees, but uh, they have a lease receivable because the lessee owes the lessor all these payments. And then guess what? It's a sales type lease in this case. It is in substance, they sold it. In substance, the lessee bought it if you met one of those five criteria. Therefore, the equipment is gonna come off their books. Here's what's interesting. They still have the legal title to that equipment. They still have that. And if the, if the lessee didn't make the lease payments, they could probably go and pull the equipment back. However, in substance, in economic substance, the, um, this has been sold and the lessee now owns it. Either they had a market purchase option or they're leasing for the major part of the, of the economic life or substantially, nearly substantially all of the fair market value in present value of lease payments. Any one of those six criteria, then they've sold it. So we, and therefore in the, in the um, accounting, we take this off the books. So it's debit, lease receivable, credit equipment. Now here's what's kind of interesting. You know, uh, there you, you pay day one, right? <laughs> you know, if you guys rent apartments or 
or dorm rooms, you got to pay up front. And so when San Sarif um, signs this lease, uh, First Lease Corporation says, great, now cut me a check for 100000 So like day one, have not even used this property yet. So has there been any interest expense here? No, that 479 uh, lease payable has not incurred $1 of interest expense uh, because uh, we made the payment up front. So what do we do? Credit cash and we debit the lease payable day one. So this is part of the day one entries. And then on the other side, First Lease Corporation has credited the lease receivable and debited cash. By the way, what's the balance of the lease payable now? It's going to be 479 that started as a credit minus a uh, debit of 100 it's going to be 379 so the lease payable amount has come down now by a hundred thousand and oh gosh i bet you love this another amortization table by the way what is interesting this is exactly like an installment loan schedule because guess what a lease is very much like an installment loan you purchased it instead of installment uh, notes uh, payments, you're making lease payments. And so the accounting and the finance lease or sell side lease works just like an installment loan as it should because in substance, we've sold the equipment or bought the equipment. So again, if you go back to my last lecture in uh, the bonds payable chapter, I did do you know, at the very end of the problems I worked on in the YouTube um, video, I did work an installment loan example, so you might want to go back to that. And you might have missed it because you wouldn't have wanted to go through the four or five bonds payable problem I worked to get to the very end of that video. Maybe I should have done that installment loan first before I did all those bonds payable problems. So how does an installment loan work? So the balance starts at the 479, and we, we paid 100,000 with no interest. Why? No time has passed. So now the balance is 379. So I got a $100,000 payment here. Now, like an installment lane, part of this payment is gonna to go to interest and part of it is gonna decrease the loan payable balance or the loan receivable balance. If you are the um, um, lessor. So just like an installment loan, I'm gonna, the interest rate was 10%. Uh, and these are annual, so I don't divide by two or anything. These are annual payments, thank God. 10% times the outstanding balance at the beginning of the period is 37,908. So of this $100,000 payment, 37,908 has is just a pure interest expense. And it's gonna go to the income statement as an interest expense. The remainder, 62,000, is gonna reduce my loans payable balance, in other words, of this 100,000, 37.9 thousand was for interest, 62.1 thousand was reducing the principal if you go back to the loans payable. So, so what would that journal entry be? And I think we'll probably see it in a minute. Debit interest expense, 37,908. Debit loan payable, if you're the lessee, credit cash for 100,000. So this is actually a little journal, journal entry here. So that, Credit balance, you debit that, now you have 316 and you repeat, it rents and repeat. And so you always take 10% of the outstanding balance at the beginning of the period 24, 869, 17. And by the way, you get down to an outstanding balance of zero. And um, in this last payment, um, even just the math works out perfectly because you know why? Because we did a good job on our time value of money calculation. We have 90,910 left. And uh, the remaining piece after interest, 90,910, we end up with zero balance there. And if we have a bargain purchase option, you know, uh, we could go buy it. So, so here again, what I just said, this is the, so for the lessee's viewpoint, they have that 37, remember from the calculation, uh, the 37,908 was interest. And they're gonna debit interest expense for 37,908. They're going to reduce the lease payable, 62,092. And that's just the difference between the 100,000 minus the interest. Like an installment loan, loan, we know what the cash is, step one. Step two, we calculate the interest. Step three, the reduction in the lease payable, the debit is the remaining difference. 
let's look at the lessor side. They receive 100,000 and some of that 100,000, exact same amount, because it's the 10%, um, is interest revenue. So it's uh, like a mirror image in, in reverse, they have interest uh, revenue where the lessee had interest expense and they reduced the lease receivable just like um, they reduced the lease payable. Now, one other thing here, now this is not true for the lessor, but this is for the lessee. You gotta go back, now let's go back to that first entry. The lessee, they put a right of use asset on their books for 479,000. And I think this was a five-year lease. Let's go back and look at it. Um, six-year lease. So this is a six-year lease. And uh, so they can't just leave that on their books. They're using that, that right of use. They're using that over the six years. So guess what we've got to do? A lot of people forget this entry. We've got to take, we got to take, the 479,000 divided by six years. I'll always use, use straight line depreciation. I won't make it crazy for you uh, if you're in my class. So divided by six. So each year we're gonna debit amortization expense and credit the right of use asset. So at the end of the six years, we'll have zero in the, in the lease payable and we'll have zero in the right of use asset and go you know, lease something else. And so this is another expense of the lease. So the the lessee has um, interest expense and amortization expense. Uh, the lessor, they just have interest revenue. Now, let's look at one other circumstance. And you know, this, this slide only related to the, the lessee, the person using the book. Now, this slide only uh, relates to the lessor. And so and let's say they manufactured this, this product. And they, and they signed up a lease and the present value of those lease payments are greater than their cost. So there's a profit there, just a normal profit. Um, instead of selling the equipment, they leased it, but it's really like selling. And so we're gonna do another entry here. And so we're gonna record um, you know, uh, sales revenue and cost of goods sold as we should, because there's a profit here. If you're just a leasing company um, and you buy it and then lease it at the same kind of value, there's no profit there. Your whole profit is, is appropriately interest revenue. However, if you're a company that's in the process of manufacturing stuff and selling it a profit, however, you lease some of it, then you want to make sure that you're recording revenue and cost of goods sold. So if there is a profit. Um, here's an example, I, I think very similar example than what we just had. So Sansory published at least printing equipment from CompuDeck, all the same thing with the same 479. The difference here, the only difference is the equipment that they are leasing only cost them 300,000. So they're gonna have a lease receivable on their books of 479 and it only cost them 300,000. So they're gonna have a little bit different entry. They're going to put the lease receivable just like we had at 479. And they're going to take the equipment off of the books, but it's 300,000. But we're going to now record revenue. That 479, the present value of all these payments, that's the kind of the fair market value of what we sold it for. So that's sales revenue, 479, 079. And we're going to record cost of goods sold related to the equipment. So with a selling profit, the income statement is going to look like this the sales revenue less the cost of goods sold um, will have a, sell, uh, a, a selling profit. So a sales type lease with selling profit, we're gonna do this entry. If there's no profit, then we're not gonna do this entry. We would just debit lease receivable and credit the equipment for the 479 with no profit. If you have a profit, you gotta come in and record revenues and cost of goods sold. That's the only difference. And by the way, um, there's no change uh, in their, all the remaining uh, entries. And this is what it says. For the lessor, when there's a selling profit, the only entry that changes is that, that very first one with the cost of goods sold. 
all the other entries for the lease payments are exactly the same. So nothing changes except that very first entry. Lessee, they could care less whether you made a profit or not. They're looking at, is this a good deal for us in, in leasing this? And so nothing changes for the lessee if there's a profit. So again, what they're saying here is uh, it's really like an installment sell, a sell on account, that the, the lease um, accounting for the lessor is works exactly like it were what if Best Buy was selling that for a TV. So they're, they're saying, well, my point I would say is these transactions always existed like this, but these leases weren't on the books, but they were in, substan in substance like a purchase, like a sell. And so now we're, we've created accounting. So they will look just like this uh, a sell on account with receivables. Okay, let's switch gears now. And um, I'm gonna tell you that for operating leases, the number one thing I'm gonna say is it's gonna work like it's always worked. You know, we're gonna accept, we're gonna put the lease on, on the books, but the expense is gonna be a straight line uh, rent expense like it always has been. Uh, you know, um, now let's just look at some of these points here. Um, the, um, the lessee is using the asset temporarily. All the rights and responsible ownership stay with the lessor because we didn't meet one of those six criteria. And so therefore, a sell is not recorded by the lessor. They do not take the equipment off their books. They leave it on their books. And then they just record um, lease revenue based on the lease. Pay. You know, pretty much like cash basis accounting. There are some quirks in there I won't get into here, but pretty much like, you know, I, you lease it for this month, you give me $100,000, I record 100,000 is lease revenue. There are no interest revenues with an operating lease. The lessee is going to record a right of use asset and a lease payable. Why? Because all these operating leases weren't on the books and those obligations could be large when added together. I think Linux, when they finally did this, uh, almost $200 million. In, in their lease payable account. It just was not on the balance sheet before. So right of use asset for 200 million, lease payable for 200 million. And so it is a, I think, a real liability. And so, so that's one way you could get tripped up on this. Um, you still have a lease payable for the lessee in an operating lease, both in an operating lease and a finance lease, still got a lease payable. The difference, and we're going to see this, is um, and how the income statement works. So uh, here's another one, the same one, I guess, the 479, uh, four annual payments of 100,000, uh, the lease payments. So uh, the lessee, the net present value of all this is 348, uh, 685, but it's an operating lease. So day one, kind of looks like a finance lease. We're going to record the right of use asset the 348 in the lease payable of 348. The lessor doesn't take the asset off its books. Nothing, you know, uh, nothing changes. They don't record a receivable or de-recognize the asset. They do nothing. So that's a different, big difference on the operating lease for the lessor. They do nothing. And they just keep depreciating according to depreciation expense uh, for the asset. And they record um, lease income, rental income, um, you know, based on the, the rents out there. So here's the first lease payment, 100,000, credit 100,000. Um, that looks the same. We're gonna take the lease payable down by 100,000. Um, but here's, here's where it, uh, it differs. It's in that second lease payment. We're gonna record um, a lease expense, an interest expense, and we're gonna reduce uh, the lease payable. So this looks the same. Here's what changes. The amortization expense, we do use a plug. Uh, we record 75,131. It's a plug. Why? We want the total lease expense to equal 100,000. Just like it did when it was just rent, <laughs> rent expense before. So in other words, in an operating lease, uh, two things have happened. One, we've got the lease obligation on the books. You know, that's good for all operating leases in the entire United States, you know, and US GAAP. 
all of them on the books. Uh, but but the, the expense hasn't changed. It's more like rent expense. And we use the amortization expense as a plug to get to uh, the 100,000. So 24,869, um, you know, 100,000 minus the interest expense, I amortize for 75,131. So I stay at $100,000 of expense, like rent expense. So finance lease, uh, let me get to that. So this is like a summary here. Amortization reflects in a finance lease, the right to use the asset in the financing of it. An operating lease is recorded in a manner, you know, to mirror the straight line rental of the expense. So the expenses are 100,000. In this case uh, that we just looked at, the total expense would be 100,000. A piece would be um, um, interest expense and the piece would be amortization. So in other words, in the next period, the interest expense will probably go down, but the amortization expense will go up. Will always be at $100,000 in expense on the income statement every single year throughout this lease if it's an operating lease. If it's a finance lease, that's not going to be true because in the first years, we'll have a higher interest expense and the amortization expense will be a flat across the board. So you have in, in a finance lease, higher expense in the earlier years, lower expense in the later years, and you have less interest expense, even though the with the amortization is straight line, it doesn't change. So we're coming to the end here for this chapter. Um, there are uh, some bits of nuances here. If a lease is less than 12 months, it's called a short-term lease, and um, you have the option to say, I'm not gonna put that on my books. And so you have the option not to recognize a right of use asset or lease liability. And, uh, and just recognize lease payments as expense. So I don't know um, how companies are doing this. They have the option to do this. In um, international rules, I'm not gonna hold you accountable for this, but just to let you know, um, if it was a de minimis lease, like a small lease, small amount, they allowed you an out. You didn't have to do that. Not for US GAAP. <laughs> you know? So that makes it hard if you have a large global company, you gotta find all of your leases that are greater than 12 months all over the world, even if they're tiny, like for a copier. You know, you gotta find all those leases and you've gotta put them on your books. So that's a, a big challenge for large uh, global companies. If, um, you know, if you go back to those parts plus stores, I wanna go back all the way through the slides to pull that picture up. But usually when you're leasing, especially retail space, you're leasing the bare bones, the walls, the floor, everything else. Inside there, you bring your stuff, right? Think Best Buy. They're leasing just bare walls. And then they bring in all those beautiful displays and the big Best Buy sign. Um, those are not part of the lease. They're not leasing those. Those are, you know, usually they construct those themselves according to their standards and their how they want to market uh, their company. And those are called leasehold improvements. So it's not part of the lease. And so it's like any other asset. It's a leasehold improvement, and then you amortize or depreciate that uh, for the useful life, uh, you know, or sometimes, you know, it may not be useful at the end, after the end of the lease, it might just be the lease term. So you got to understand this, all this stuff we put in this Best Buy store, could we just move it and put it in another Best Buy store somewhere else? If yes, you might be able to use a longer term than the, um, than the lease, but you got to really think through. But they're, they are leasehold improvements, like any other asset, they get depreciated. So it's really kind of not part of lease accounting, but to be aware of it, because it is, it is part of what you're leasing, the stuff that you put in there. So many disclosures around leases. It is pretty crazy. Uh, that's where I'm kind of happy. I am really not, <laughs> I'm teaching, not doing, because you know, you know, when you ever talk about disclosures like this, you got to go find all the data and information around the world to be able to disclose the things they want. You know, um, you know even to get into the amount, timing, and certainty of cash flows, you might have you know hundred thousand different leases. You got to you know calculate all this up, make sure you got all the leases in your calculation, and it's got to be both qualitative information about all these leases and quantitative. So uh, the lease disclosure, as they say, 
are quite extensive. Fortunately, they're not holding me accountable and I'm not holding my students accountable to know all those requirements, but just know there's a lot of disclosure. And uh, so with that, I am going to uh, end, the, end the lecture here. And I thank you for spending time with me and uh, good luck on lease accounting. I think it is a very interesting area. And as much as I was happy not to implement lease accounting, I'm very happy that these rules came about. I think it was a big hole in accounting. When I studied accounting, it was like, man, these leases, they're not on the balance sheet. It's not right, you know? <laughs> but we, the FASB had a hard time getting to put this on the balance sheet because there's so many of these leasing companies that are challenging the FASB. They didn't want the, these rules, you know, because they were able to do a lot of leasing because they were able to get leases off the balance sheets for companies no longer. And so I'm glad these rules are in effect and I'm sure companies will be uh, better and more efficient at applying them over time. So again, thank you for your time today and uh, good luck with this material.